uh, my pleasure, and I am delighted to um, speak with you and share this time with you um, this afternoon. And so I drew the uh, topic of Korean American immigration history from, 19, from 1871 to 1992. Um, however, I just could not resist updating some of the some of the data points um, as far as Korean Americans are concerned. And I thought there were some compelling new developments in the uh, migration patterns of uh, South Koreans to the United States. Um, and I thought it was especially relevant for uh, teachers. And so I incorporated them. And so I think uh, maybe a fairer uh, time frame is like, you know, maybe uh, 2020. <laughs> but uh, uh, over the years, I've been doing this uh, for a number of years now, and one of the real highlights of these presentations is the, are the um, email exchanges that I uh, have with uh, the, the participants um, of the workshop. And so you see my email address here if you have any questions or follow up or, um, or, or any comments, I welcome you to um, uh, send them my way. Okay, and so uh, let's get started. Um, let's see, in order to understand the Korean American history, it's necessary to take a little bit of a time capsule and then go back to, oh, how far back? About the 1860s and 70s, right? When um, the sort of history of Western imperialism and colonization that flows out of Europe after the Dark Ages makes its way across the world. And in many ways, um, Korean Peninsula would be one of the very last places where these dynamics um, will end up. And I think it has very interesting sort of consequences for both Korea and for the United States. And I'll get to that in a, in a second. Uh, for those of you who might have had some interest in geography, you know that a lot of geographers believe that geography is destiny and that so much of a nation's history and politics and culture can be um, discerned from the geography of a particular uh, 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 nation. And I think in some ways there's probably, a Korea could credibly claim to be on the very top of a list of nations, right? Where its geography has had such dramatic and, and profound impact uh, over the centuries. And as you could see, Korea is in the middle of things. Uh, what things? No less than three civilizational nation cultures that view Korea as a, like a land bridge to invade the Asian continent or a buffer zone to check another nation's aggressive ambitions. And it stands at the nexus then of the Chinese, Russian, and Japanese civilizations, right? And so Korea sort of understands itself and I'm sure you are going to engage uh, a lot of this. Uh, Korea sort of imagines itself as a shrimp among the whales, right? And so whenever there's a ambition, clash of ambitions between say China and Japan or Russia and Japan, it's Korea that, um, you know, gets squashed, right? And, um, and that's been a, a very important part of Korea's history. Um, the next slide, what I would like to share is a number of, I think, sort of hooks in this earlier history of Korean American experience that I think if you sort of understand them, then you'll be able to reconstruct the story of how is it that so many Koreans ended up coming to the United States and maybe even far more dramatically how is it that when we look at where Koreans are, Koreans are today, that so many Koreans are in Central Asia, Russia, China, Japan, and Koreans are 
um, a diasporic people, right? And so the whole idea here is that a proper understanding of this slide will contextualize the Korean American history within this sort of broader narrative of what happened in the late 1800s and early 1900s that sort of threw off so many hundreds of thousands of Koreans out of the peninsula into various uh, corners of the world, right? And so when we begin with things, what we're, where we begin is this era of gunboat diplomacy, right? And we know maybe, maybe the most famous example of gunboat diplomacy is what happens to China just, um, you know, uh, 30 years earlier, right? And so in China, Great Britain, of course, uh, tries to find relief to their trade deficit. And the best way to do that is to sail these gunboats into Hong Kong and Canton and fight China over the right to trade opium. And that opens up China, Western powers pour in and China becomes this frontier for um, sort of the dividing and, and carving up China into various parts, right? And um, if you've ever been to Shanghai, you know, you see the French quarters and the German quarters and the English quarters and the Japanese quarters, all signs of this um, unfortunate chapter uh, in global history. The point here is that after China, Japan and Korea are implicated as the last two places without all that much hyperbole in the world that Western powers haven't opened up, right? And so races on to who's gonna open up Japan, who's going to open up Korea. Um, the idea that this comes to us in such a late part of global history is that America opens up Japan, right? So the United States of America, who itself, right, in the larger scheme of things was a British colony, is the country that sails into Edo Bay with Commodore Perry and, you know, forces Japan to sign a treaty, right? And we know that as Meiji Restoration and the sort of narrative of Japan uh, joining uh, modern nation states of that time. Um, now, what happens in uh, 1860s is that Americans come to Korea, uh, try to open up Korea like they did uh, in Japan. Unfortunately, Koreans uh, do not treat American encroachment kindly, right? And so the soldiers that were guarding the Han River act upon the order that you fire first and ask questions second, right? And they destroy American merchant ships. And so in 1871, the big co contact that Korea has with the United States is when US Marines land uh, on, on Korean soil as a punitive action to, these, to teach these Koreans a lesson they destroy a bunch of villages and then they go back to uh, the United States. And so in an amazing turn of events, what happens is the Western power that forces Korea to open up from its era of isolation is none other than Japan, who itself was opened up, right, uh, by the United States. And when Japan arrives in Korea, they are not going to be fired upon. If they fire upon Japan, there will be massive consequences. Koreans now understand this, having had a front row seat to what happened in China and Japan. So they signed this treaty, treaty called Kwangpa Treaty, named after the island in which this uh, treaty was signed with Japan. And so Japan is the country that imposes the unequal treaty on Korea. And I'm sure through this webinar, you have been uh, learning a lot about that um, fraught uh, relationship, right? Um, now, what Japan does is it, it thinks that being a modern nation state is to have a colony, 
it's to be able to dominate other places. And Korea is, of course, the most important place for it serves as a land bridge um, uh, uh, to the rest of Asia. Um, the Americans come seven years after Kwang Hwa Treaty, and they also want to sign a treaty. Koreans are eager to sign a treaty with the United States, right? The Korean position is there's no way we're going to defeat Japan in a war. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bring the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans into Korea. And maybe these great big powers will fight among themselves and leave us alone. And so Americans are welcome to Korea. Missionaries come by the bunches, right? And this is a time when all these young American men are being educated and in these colleges and universities and they seek their fortunes across the Pacific, right? Uh, American companies come from AT&T to Westinghouse to, you know, uh, uh, put their mark uh, in the Korean Peninsula. The big idea here, though, is that Japan is not going to allow Korea to um, maintain their independence. And so I'm going to just skip a little bit and then just simply say that uh, Japan will fight two wars, um, wars with China and Russia with the sole purpose of kicking these powers out of the Korean Peninsula. So they could do what? So they could eventually annex Korea into Japan itself, right? And so uh, if you are familiar with Asian history, um, Japan and China fighting a war and Japan winning is an amazing monumental deal, right? And, um, you know, um, but China, of course, is dealing with opium wars. They're in no position to fight the Japanese. Russians also are defeated in a naval battle with, um, with Japan. And what happens is in 1905, just two months after Japan defeats Russia, Japanese government make Korea a protectorate of Japan. What that means is that the Koreans have like a nominal independence. They get to have a say in the internal affairs of the country, but the big decisions like foreign affairs, uh, basic you know, economic policy and, and all of that um, is vested in uh, the powers in Tokyo, right? And um, you know, five years uh, after that in 1910, um, that kind of nicety of nominal independence is simply eliminated and, and Korea now is part of the Japanese empire, right? And um, what that means is that Korea is literally wiped off the map, uh, off, the, uh, off the map and Koreans are no more. Well, then, then uh, Koreans become the so-called emperor's people who have much of the responsibilities of being part of the Japanese empire, but not all of the rights and privileges of full Japanese citizens. In that sense, they become colonized people, right? While all this is going on, there's a, a fascinating figure who is, whose name is Horace Allen, and Horace Allen was an American missionary and a medical doctor. And due to a set of um, coincidences, he gain, gains the confidence of the Korean court, royal court, and his advice to the Korean king is this, and that is, in, back in 1903, uh, back in yeah, 1900, um, and his, his, his advice to the king is, one day soon, Korea will be no more. And only way for Koreans to be able to regain Korea is for Koreans to be outside of Korea, right? And the, uh, the advice is you should send Koreans to America. And Hawaii is now part of the United States after 1900. And James Paul G. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, and then, uh, and so the idea here is that what you should do is send Koreans to the United States. United States is, a, is going to be a major power in the world. 
And those Koreans could lobby the United States to government to come to Korea's rescue. And so uh, that's the advice. And, uh, and so the Korean government begins to then allow immigrants to go to Hawaii and then go to mainland United States. Um, in political sense, it's seen as this kind of an insurance policy and Lord have mercy, that insurance policy will pay off and it will change history, right? Because, um, and, and you'll see, <laughs> you'll see why. Uh, one of the most dramatic footages I've ever seen is that after the Second World War, there was a friendly baseball game between, um, uh, between a baseball team from Incheon, uh, Harbor City, you know, where the airport is now, and then a baseball team from Hawaii that played at a baseball field in Honolulu, right? This was in 1946, after 36 years of Japanese colonialism. And guess which one of the kid, which set of the kids could speak the Korean language? And the idea is that the kids from Hawaii could speak Korean language because they learned it from their community and from their family. But the Korean kids from Incheon in Korea could not speak Korean, for they were only taught Japanese language, right? And so this is this interesting idea that, once again, without hyperbole, Korea experiences this traumatic existential erasure, right? And um, very few, but there are you know other countries that have gone through that in that tumultuous um, historical period, right? Um, all right. Now, what first thing that Japan does, once Japan controls Korea's foreign policy in 1905, remember the, uh, the Protectorate Treaty of 1905, um, first thing it does is that it prevents Koreans from immigrating to Hawaii and to the United States because the Japanese know that Koreans in America are troublemakers, right? As soon as they land in the US, they agitate for political change, okay? And so um, after the uh, Korean exclusion, there is no more migration of substantial numbers of workers uh, who will go to Hawaii who will land in San Francisco and um, come to America. Um, in that sense, Korean immigration during this time is very much contained. Uh, however, after 1905, there are uh, streams of Koreans who go to the United States and many of them would be political exiles. Um, so, a very common pattern is they would be arrested in Korea by the Japanese military uh, and the police for engaging in political behavior, independence movement. And they would serve time in a Japanese prison and then they would steal away, uh, oftentimes with the help of sympathetic American missionaries and make it to the United States, right? And among those people, I would like to just sort of share three of them with you. And um, the reason why I share three of them is because they represent a kind of a strategy Koreans might have about how they could bring about this independence. So the first person that you see on your left is Sung Man Ri. He is no less than the very first president of Republic of Korea, right? And he comes to, the, comes to the United States at the age of 29. He graduates from George Washington University, gets his master's at Harvard and a PhD in Princeton. Uh, his advisor at Princeton is no less than Woodrow Wilson himself, right? Who, um, you know, promulgates this whole idea of um, right to sovereignty, uh, um, and, you know, League of Nations. Um, and Sun Man Ri will anchor what is called the diplomatic faction within the Korean American community. And so his idea is exactly the same as Horace Allen's idea, that they need to diplomatically lobby US government. And 
Sun Man Ri's dissertation was exactly about that at Princeton, right? How one day the imperial ambitions of Japan and the United States would clash, that would result in a massive war, and that will give Koreans an opportunity to win their independence, right? So this is where your students would drop the mic. Right? That's, that's, that's exactly what happens. The guy in the middle, his name is Park Young Man. And uh, what he does is that he believes that any independence won by another country will mean that Koreans will somehow have to pay. That the only way to win independence in Korea's own terms is to have Koreans in the diaspora in Korea itself to pick up arms and fight the Japanese themselves, right? And so what does he do? He goes to University of Nebraska, majors in military science and political science and leads this militant faction, right? And the last person you see here, who's a big hero of Edward Chang, a person that you heard uh, 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 yesterday, his name is An Chang Ho. And what is unique about An Chang Ho was that he did not see the Korean American community as this exile community that would one day go back to Korea. He also thought that it was very important for Korean Americans to win what we would today call like civil rights, um, to become more permanent members of American society to have a thriving community and a community of virtue um, that would allow then Koreans to have a dignified life here in America. And then it would empower them to be better agents of change in Korea, right? And so uh, An Chang Ho's house itself, it still stands. It's, the, it's where Center for Korean Studies is housed at USC. So if you, are ever on the USC campus, you could see his house um, uh, there, okay? Um, in addition to the stories of these uh, big figures, uh, the life of Korean Americans during this historical time was relatively and very much modest. And so the Koreans that came to the United States much of their life was involved in migrant farm work and tenant farming. And so this is a direct result of the work that the Chinese Americans did, building the railroad, building those earthen dams that created one of the richest agricultural regions in the world. And it would be up to the Japanese and the Koreans and the Filipinos and the Mexicans to work the fields and to um, uh, make this area productive. Uh, for the Korean Americans, because they were viewed as Japanese in the eyes of the US government, they were allowed to have picture brides, right? Unlike the Chinese and the Filipinos and Indians who were not allowed to bring wives. And so because Koreans were able to bring wives and reconstitute a family and community, and most importantly, uh, because these families had dual income now, they were able to make the transition into land ownership. And so um, that also, though, invited a different kind of hostility. And so here in California, California state passed a law called Alien Land Act of 1913 that said, if you are an immigrant who cannot become a citizen, you cannot own land. Right, And so many of you might be thinking like, what the heck does that mean? And that is, well, there are two types of foreigners at this time. One type of immigrant are immigrants who are white who could become citizens and they could own land. But another type of immigrants are immigrants who could not become citizens and they could not own land. And at this time, the only people who could not become citizens in America were Asians, right? And that's because in 1790, the US naturalization stipulated that only whites could become citizens. Um, that would be changed because of the Civil War and Blacks could become citizens, but Asians could not. Um, a lot of Koreans by that point had children. And so they 
turned the deed of the land over to their children's name who were US born citizens. And that loophole was closed in 1920. And so for the Korean community, Korean American and the Japanese American community after the 1920 act, they me it meant that they needed to surrender much of their agriculture and flee to the cities where they could eke out a living in the ethnic economy, right? And uh, once again, this is a very sad chapter in uh, the Asian American experience. Uh, despite those legal restrictions, there were successful Korean farmers and Kim brothers in Ridley, California is a good example of this, Charles and Henry, who fought for and gained the patent to the nectarine, right? And so before the Kim brothers came along, you either had a peach or a plum, but these two geniuses put them together and gave us the nectarine and they became the very first Korean millionaires uh, in this country and uh, were very, very successful. Um, uh, a very important uh, court case that Koreans were involved in is a uh, citizenship case called Isak Emson Char versus the United States. Uh, Emson Char was a teenager when he lied about his age and got to Hawaii to work in the plantations came to the mainland, graduated from college, in fact, attended medical school for a hot second before he was drafted into the US Army. <laughs> for what war? The First War. Can you imagine? He's a, he was a veteran of the First uh, World War. And the law at the time allowed any foreigner who served in the US military during World War I to gain American citizenship. Um, immediately. So he was granted citizenship. But then when the United States government saw his papers and saw that he was Asian, stripped him of his citizenship. And he sued the United States government, but ultimately he lost. And it was affirmed that even if an individual Korean had the merit of being a citizen, namely that he was a World War I veteran, what was more important than, than that was his um, group membership, was his racial membership as an Asian. And so Emson Char was denied um, citizenship. And what that did was it paved the groundwork for the National Origins Act of 1924 that simply stated that um, aliens who are ineligible to citizenship cannot immigrate to the United States. And that would even curtail the migration of these student exiles who could come to the United States. And it hermetically sealed Asia from the, from the US when it comes to immigration, okay? Um, now with the National Origins Act of 1924 and the Emerson Char decision, my point, and this is a little controversial <laughs> among the Korean American history circles is that Koreans really double down on the independence movement when they find that they cannot become citizens in America, right? And I think I'm always intrigued by how an alternate possibility might have been. Maybe if they could become citizens in the US, we would have a much different political trajectory where Korean Americans would have been more active participants in American politics, let's say like the Irish or the Armenians did, but instead, Koreans became much more focused and obsessed with the independence movement, right? And that was a, a major preoccupation of this community. Um, now, of course, Korea would gain its independence not by the dint of the hard work that the diaspora did, but they would gain the independence when, gain their independence when US would drop, you know, two atomic bombs in Japan and then Japan surrendered unconditionally. Um, now, uh, with that going on, uh, the last sort of historical chapter or, or item for Korean American history is the Korean War. And so Korean War rages between 1950 and 1953. And in 1952, the United States government feels that in order to reward 
or in order to recognize America's allyship with South Korea, Korean Americans should be granted the right to become citizens and should be given a quota to legally immigrate to the United States. And so McCarran-Walter Act of 1952 is a Cold War Act, right? That this is happening between, you know, a proxy war between Soviet Union and the United States. The United States is fighting for values of democracy and justice and, and equality in the world. It was seen as like hypocritical to uh, exclude Koreans and Japanese from naturalization and immigration. And so uh, with the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952, Koreans are no longer under uh, this restriction from becoming a citizen of this country. And with all the attending kind of um, discrimination that followed that, uh, that status, right? Including ability to own land and so on, okay? Um, the image that I would like to share with you, two images, is the uh, photo of Emson Char. And uh, so you see Emson Char here, who ultimately could not secure citizenship in the United States. For him, this was a monumental decision because his wife, who was also very active in the independence movement, if he could not become a citizen, she would have to be deported. And then she would probably be met by the Japanese authorities with severe consequences. Uh, American congressmen um, looked kindly upon her and filed a petition to let her stay. Um, with the exclusion from the mainstream society, Koreans turned inward and the important institution that, um, that channels uh, Korean community energy is the church. And so this is a community in Ridley, Ridley and uh, uh, financed by the uh, Kim brothers with their nectarine money. And you see the, the community photographed there, right? Unlike the Chinese community, you see all the wives and the children. Um, if we were to have a photograph like this during that time of the Chinese community, by and large, it would be of single men, right? All right. Um, for the contemporary Korean immigration experience, um, I think by and large, this contemporary uh, moment can be divided into two parts. Right, and so after the McCarran uh, Walter Act, you know, after the Korean War, the driver of change in America is the civil rights movement, right, led by African Americans, and that would have a profound impact on Asian Americans. In fact, I would argue like a defining effect because, in addition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights of 1965, the Immigration Act of 1965 fundamentally changes America, right? I tell all my students that they are children of Immigration Act of 1965. So the Immigration Act of 1965 removes for the first time since 1882, any racial or ethnic based restriction on immigration and all the countries could send immigrants um, you know, under this uh, quota preference system. And it emphasizes you know, family reunification and uh, Latinos and Asian Americans are the biggest beneficiaries of Immigration Act of 1965. And it transforms America from a, um, hang on one second. It's like the phone never rings in the house, but except when I do this. Uh, um, and so, um, right, uh, so, so the Immigration Act of 1965 has this uh, transformative impact and Latinos and Asian Americans are the primary beneficiaries and, um, you know, American society would be forever um, altered. The Immigration Act of 1965 really emphasized kind of humanitarian 
values of family reunification. And it really emphasized the migration of relatives of people who are in America already. And what this meant was initially it favored you know, wealthy and skilled immigrants, but over time it favored a much broader class and educational strata of immigrants, right? And if you remember sort of the Reagan era, um, since I'm talking to teachers, I'm sure many of you do, not like just college students, there was a great rethinking of this Immigration Act. And in 1990, a new immigration law was introduced. And what it sought to do is it, it reacted to this idea that maybe immigrants are too poor, maybe immigrants are too working class, maybe immigrants are becoming a burden on the welfare program. And so what we want to do in 1990, or what the United States government did in 1990, was to re-emphasize and give more advantage to immigrants who would come to the United States as skilled workers and investors. And so for the first time in American history, just by the virtue of the fact that you could invest a million dollars into the US economy and create 10 American jobs, boom, you could secure a green card. And I think what happens with the Korean immigration is that these policy changes comes at a very important time in Korea because 1990 is exactly the time in which Korean economy takes off and it becomes this high tech juggernaut that we see today, right? And so the point here is that unlike some countries, Korean community was impacted by both the kind of the inclusivity of the 65 Act and the restrictiveness of the 1990 Act, right? And so for Koreans, who were producing large numbers of engineers and doctors and scientists, and then who were um, buoyed by economic boom in Korea, Immigration Act of 1990, rather restricting them, gave them this other avenue of migration into this country, okay? Um, different faces of Korean American community, I think, reflects those realities, right? And so here, one photo is uh, that from, you know, Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance. And so there are number of Korean Americans who are working class, uh, who live in poorer communities, um, who must work in low wage, dead end ethnic economy jobs. Um, and, and those folks um, look to labor advocacy, right? Increasing the minimum wage is something that is incredibly meaningful for them. Yet at the same time, part of that community coexists with, you know, the arrival of Hyundai and Kia and Samsung and the kind of migration that those folks bring in are people who are, you know, enormously skilled, um, having graduated from the top universities in the world as well as uh, executives and managers who are, you know, the one percenters, right? And, and so on. Uh, additionally, I think Korean immigration to the United States has now been uh, uh, ongoing. And so we are a community that's not only engaged in economic survival, but also political participation. And so we have an image of David Liu, who was, um, the very first Korean American elected to the city council, um, former council member David Yu, um, but you know, coming after 20 years after the LA civil unrest, this was a monumental victory for Korean Americans um, in the city. Okay, I wanted to share with you some very quickly some of the quantitative data points. Like I said. Um, this is an interesting chart, and this is the migration of Koreans uh, plotted against the South Korea GDP per capita, right? And if you look at the year 1970, the reason why it is so low is not because I'm starting at zero, 
it's because the per capita GDP per year in 1980 in Korea was less than $500, right? And as the per capita GDP rises, the immigration numbers come down, right? But at certain point, immigration numbers go up. What that tells us is that Korean migration is not just a product of people who are desperate to leave poverty, which was the case in the 1970s. Um, these are people who are coming because they're taking full advantage of trans-Pacific opportunity, right? And um, they're coming because they have economic interests uh, in the United States. Okay. Uh, this is the population dynamics. And as you could see, uh, immigration numbers uh, reached their peak in the 1980s, but since then the numbers have come down and it's been consistent now. And I don't know what COVID is going to uh, do to these numbers, but it's been consistently about 14,000 to 19,000 Koreans coming per year. And what is notable about that is that for vast majority of Koreans, um, they're simply adjusting their visa status. So they're not, they're, the, the, the classic immigrant is somebody who gets in an airplane at Incheon, they fly for the first time to America and they land in LAX. That's not the case. Um, vast majority of Korean immigrants are already here under a student visa or as a temporary worker visa working for Kia or Samsung. And they decide, you know what? I'm going to petition the US government and change my visa status. And that is the, that is the overwhelmingly the case. Um, the next slide is the social characteristics of, of uh, new permanent residents. And what we see here is that indeed, shockingly, 60% of all new green card holders hold that status because of their employment-based immigrants, right? It means that they have extraordinary skills and skills that American native-born population cannot fill. Now, that's why they're coming. Um, it used to be that this number was very low when I immigrated in 1975. 75% uh, of all the immigrants were family-related. Uh, but now this has changed. And so this is having a big impact for the school teachers. What this means is that for many of you, your students in your classroom are going to be sons and daughters of highly educated, highly skilled, maybe even wealthy immigrants who might have certain expectations of where their children ought to be. Um, and you know, the frontline stories I hear over and over again are those academic, um, you know, uh, pressures. Um, this is the geographic concentration of where Koreans are. Um, you know, uh, interesting uh, idea. Everybody knows that it's New York and, I mean, Los Angeles and New York heavy, but increasingly the population is in Atlanta that you see here, um, Texas. Um, and there's older communities in places like Chicago. Okay. Uh, these are the destination of new immigrants. You see those numbers, you know, expressed um, in the uh, in the in the in the in that previous map. But Los Angeles is still the number one destination for Korean immigrants. And when they think about the American dream, they're thinking about the suburbs of, of Southern California, right? Um, this is a very interesting density map. I tried to find more recent ones and I just couldn't find it. Um, it's, I'm sure it'll be updated once the, um, uh, updated soon. But what, what is interesting about this map, and if you know your Southern California or, or Los Angeles metropolitan area, it seems like there are two kinds of clusters <laughs> of Korean community. And it all implicates your profession, right? And one is Koreans are concentrated where their ethnic economy is. 
here's Koreatown, here's Garden Grove, and, um, and places like that. But the other places, Diamond Bar, Fullerton, Irvine, South Bay, what does that implicate? It implicates good school districts, right? Or, or parts of Southern California that have the reputation as having outstanding school districts. What is flabbergasting here is that Korean geography, Korean American geography mirror the geography of educational excellence um, in the public schools, right? And um, it is rare for a community to mirror <laughs> uh, this uh, so closely. And all of that to say that um, I think as uh, school teachers, you are in a, a kind of a front line of um, where Korean American community is and their aspirations. And if you've been a teacher for a long while in Southern California, I'm sure you've seen the changes and the evolution of this community um, during your um, career. And in the beginning, it was wonderful to have, um, have Mrs. Kim, you know, acknowledge uh, teachers who had long careers. And I'm sure you guys have interesting war stories to tell about, um, about Korean students and their parents. So with that, why don't I stop? And I know that uh, I've gone a little over than, than my allotted time. I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Uh -huh. Thank you. How about round of applause for Dr. Park? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. If you have any questions, uh, just write on uh, at the chat box or maybe uh, take a moment to organize your thoughts, your questions in the chat, or if you'd like to speak to say it, please um, click the icon, raise hand icon, and then I'll call on you. We'll have about five minutes for Q&A. Uh, is Jeff? Oh, yes. Somebody's got their hand. Someone has their hand up. Hi, Dr. Park. How are you doing? Hi. So great hearing uh, your sharing. Once again, I always love hearing the way that you talk about Korean American history. Always a pleasure. Uh, I do have a question. Um, you have such a special way where you share the Korean American story beginning in Korea and then ongoing to uh, current and modern day. Do you have a book or paper published on the topic? Yes, uh, uh, I would be more than happy to um, share uh, my website. If you go on my website, there's a, a set of articles, but yeah, if you email me, I'd be more than happy to send you a collection of, of articles that, that I uh, put together. Um, um, if you ask me really nicely, I, 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 I've been um, lucky enough to be a co-editor of a Asian American encyclopedia uh, series. And so um, that's like a million word reference work and um, I could share that with uh, with teachers as well, but uh, um, and it's been fun um, to write on different parts of the Korean American experience. And so, um, you know, my most recent article has really been about all these legal changes that's been happening in South Korea. That's made uh, made it much easier for Korean Americans to um, to go and work and live uh, in South Korea. And so, um, you know, it's about this kind of transnational turn that's happening in the Korean American community. Um, I, I'll also have a forthcoming article on uh, Stacey Abrams in Atlanta and the kind of coalition work that she's been doing with Korean American young leaders um, in Atlanta. Um, and so, you know, um, so there's, there's that. Uh, I'm still toying with this idea of uh, writing an article called uh, Miracle on Figueroa. Is it street or boulevard? <laughs> and, and what that's about is, uh, you know, my daughter uh, took me to a BTS concert uh, when they played at the Staples Center. And my mind was so blown, you know, <laughs> about um, 
about sort of the popularity of K-pop and, you know, stuff that I could have never imagined in my lifetime to have happened. And so, you know, the, my engagement with the Korean American experience has been a source of enormous pleasure, uh, constant surprise, and just always feeling like I have this privileged position, having like a front row seat into so much of um, what's happening, not just in Korea or in the US, but, but in the world. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Park. You tell the story so well. And I, I've listened to a lot of stories, but you tell it in such a special way. So thank you so much, Dr. Park. Please, my head is big enough. I, it doesn't need to grow anymore. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or comments? AK in the chat, is that a question to Dr. Park? Which class do you teach? Oh, the courses I teach, um, because I've taken on so much administrative responsibilities, I've been by and large teaching just two courses. One is uh, Asian American history course, uh, like a survey of Asian American experience. And as you could maybe discern from why way I approach this lecture, you know, I'm not really invested in telling the special story of how special Korean Americans are, even though I think they're very special, you know, most of the time. Um, I'm really interested in approaching the Korean American experience from a much broader perspective of experience of race and ethnicity in American society, and as well as like sort of the broader Asian American experience. And, and what's really interesting is like, in today, right, where Asian Americans are viewed as like model minorities, it is, I think, shocking for a lot of people to know that Asian Americans were the most difficult and intractable uh, people for American government, right? And that is to say, Asian Americans would be the very last group of people to have the right to become citizens, you know, not until 1952. And so, um, you know, uh, 80 years after African Americans win that um, win that right, and so um, you know, so so that's that's that idea, um, um, and I think you know it's really important for me then to um, show my show Asian American students that they are not spectators to American politics of inclusion, but they are really at the at the their their, their participants in that, in that, in that, in that struggle, right? Um, I also teach an immigration course, and I love that course because um, what I do is a walking tour of Koreatown um, with my students. Um, and if you're lucky enough to teach at Loyola Marymount, you could do that because you're you have a class size of 24 instead of. <laughs> Uh, you'll hear from my younger brother, who's a professor at UC Santa Barbara, right? It's like, you can't take 120 students on a walking tour of Koreatown. And then I have students do a photo essay of their, of an immigrant community of their choice. And um, so that's always a fun assignment. And I've been keeping all the restaurant recommendations that my students uh, bring to me. <laughs> and so I'm never uh, short of you know, ethnic restaurants to try throughout Southern California. And so uh, that's been a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Park.